Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the power of diversity, making our industry more open, inclusive, and diverse. When IPA President Yuko Setzer asked me to become the IPA's presidential envoy for diversity and inclusion, I immediately accepted. It's a topic close to my heart, and it's important for our industry. An importance which will only increase over time. At Elsevier, the company where I work, we have put DNI on the agenda for many years. Not only for our own staff, but also we are contributing to the DNI agenda in the world of research. For instance, through the, our gender in science reports. Personally, I started at Elsevier the first Pride chapter almost 10 years ago. And today we have 15 chapters all around the world supporting DNI through the LGBTQ lens. And I'm a proud executive sponsor of Pride at Elsevier Worldwide. If you're watching us, you're probably sitting at home or in an empty office, um, feeling the effects of the pandemic and wondering why you should think about DNI exactly now. Actually, this pandemic has in many ways highlighted inequalities and also proven that innovation is made possible through creative thinking by diverse teams. Take this platform, for example, that has mobilized publishers to come together and chat about what concerns us, an inclusive forum for all. So it makes sense to take some time to chat about the power of diversity and how it should be harnessed for our publishing industry. Let me first define what we mean. What is diversity or DNI in short exactly? I like the comparison with the invitations to a party. Diversity means that everybody is invited, irrespective of gender, ethnicity, age, sexuality, etc. Inclusion means that everybody who is invited is also invited to dance or to drink at the bar. So to put this more formally, an inclusive workplace allows all to be truly themselves, to be valued, and through their contribution to help lead the ways for others. There are two important reasons to be fully supportive of DNI. There's a clear business case and there is a moral imperative. It's simply the right thing to do. I will not go into the details of the business case, but studies have shown that organizations that have a gender diverse leadership perform significantly better financially. Companies that embrace ethnic diversity at the top also perform better, even better than gender diverse companies. And it's not simply a bonus for diversity, there's also a price to pay for non-diversity, as is shown by non-diverse companies, and they perform significantly more poorly than their peers. Better financial performance in organizations that embrace DNI is driven by better decision making, more innovation, better staff attraction and retention, higher job satisfaction, and an overall enhanced reputation. And that also applies to our publishing industry. We face a far more diverse readership and perhaps also authorship than in the past. And we can expect that societal changes will only result in more diversity in the future. And publishers that also reflect that diversity themselves will be better prepared for that future. A future that now, of course, will be significantly impacted by the corona pandemic. Publishers around the world have shown that they can be agents of change, of societal change, addressing, for instance, gender inequality, starting with children books, school books, literature, and scientific studies. The power of publishing in shaping our future societies should not be underestimated. DNI cannot be seen separate from the societies we live in. And in the IPA, we have members from parts all around the world and they are active under very different societal circumstances. And it's not surprising that diversity will mean something different in Delhi than in Tokyo, Frankfurt, London, Rio, or Sharjah. But we do see common themes and also similar challenges worldwide. What we want to achieve by putting DNI more prominently on the agenda at the IPA is to share best practices, how IPA members can address this and also to better empower the publishers' organizations so that they can serve their members, the publishers, better in the area of DNI. So on to today's panel. 
And I will invite all three panelists on the screen to join me. And I'm very honored to introduce our star-studded lineup to discuss the power of diversity today. We are joined today by Stephen Lottinga, who is the Chief Executive of the Publishers Association. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. We are joined by Badur al Qasimi, the Vice President of the International Publishers Association and CEO and founder of Kalimat Publishing Group. Welcome, Badur. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Edna Watko, long time industry observer and currently a journalist for Publishers Weekly. And Ed is not be seen at this moment, but I welcome <laughs> you as well, Ed. I feel like a ghost, but I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. Good. Let me start then um, with Stephen. So back in 2017, the UK Publishers Association launched a UK industry-wide inclusivity action plan to tackle diversity. At the core of this was the launch of a landmark annual diversity study. Um, and it came with some very ambitious targets to aim at achieving a better gender and ethnic balance. I think the UK was the first association to really address this topic of diversity and inclusion. And so we're very happy, Stephen, to have you here to tell us more about it. So the first question, so you launched this initiative in 2017. Um, and do you feel that the UK publishing industry is more diverse today in 2020? Thank you, Michiel. Um, I certainly believe so. Uh, our data suggests that it is. But as I think you really said in your introduction that when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, we are talking about a broader set of issues than just the kind of the data, just the sheer numbers. Um, we're talking about real changes in working practices, who we employ, where we find them, what we ask them to do. So yes, we've been real, we are making progress in the UK, um, uh, particularly on some of the targets um, we have put in place, but there is a long, long way to go. Um, I think at the end of this, we envisage a um, publishing industry which better reflects the um, society that we're trying to communicate with. And it would be wrong of me to claim that we have uh, got there yet. Um, um, one of the issues that we um, sought to address, we have made very real progress. So that was around the gender balance, particularly around um, women in senior leadership positions. So we have seen a real, uh, so some significant um, uh, improvements there. And you would expect that and hope that. Um, we have an industry which employs 70% women. So um, we've already within our industry, there are some very, very talented women. And it isn't that hard, therefore, to bring them forward and make sure that they are in senior um, roles. But there are some much more systemic problems that we face, maybe particularly around ethnicity, but more broadly than that, uh, disability, for example, as well, um, where where progress is slower. Uh, and I think that would probably be true across um, other, other industries and our wider society as well. So it's not just a problem facing uh, publishing, um, but we're really trying to take um, forward positive action um, to address it. As you said, our action plan wasn't just about targets. I mean, targets is something which helps to focus people's attention. It was also about trying to support publishers in changing the practices about um, providing unconscious bias training, making sure they had inclusivity plans within their businesses, trying to encourage somebody at board level to take and adopt these issues and champion them. So it's about a much wider set of um, changes in culture and practices that we're trying to help support publishing to, to, to achieve. That's great. And I think you also had an award program and the minister came. So I think th that really puts a spotlight on it as well, I believe. Yeah, I mean, again, it would be um, slightly false to pretend that we're doing this in isolation. There is, uh, there is a lot of attention in wider society uh, in the UK about these issues and making sure that um, the industry is addressing them. And we want to be at the forefront of that. We, we believe that um, the publishing is a, um, a future oriented business that will be around for a very long time. And we believe we can show real leadership on these issues. Um, and so we, are, we have both um, put in place awards to recognize excellence and we are we are also recognized uh, by our government ministers for the work that's been um, undertaken. But um, but I would be careful not to say we're there is there is lots more that needs to be done. So it puts you also maybe in a stronger position when you have a dialogue with with government officials. 
fair it does. It really helps on that front. I think if you're if you're there are wider business benefits both for individual companies but also for us as an association to be seen yeah. to address societal issues. Um, it, it definitely means that we get a, a wider hearing on um, uh, on some of the other matters that we're that we're addressing. But that wasn't, if I'm honest, it wasn't the real motivation. There was a yeah. recognition by our members that this was the right thing to do. I mean, you talked, we talked, both talked about the kind of the business benefits, but there are there is a moral imperative here um, that we need to um, address, uh, and um, and there was good strong leadership shown by by particularly my council about, and there was a lot of people questioning whether this was the right thing to do, whether the association should um, should take a um, a role in this. A lot of people worried that, about what happens if they're the ones who get left behind. So. There, there's all course concerns that need to be overcome when you're trying to take a whole industry in a particular direction. But I think um, actually the, the, the most exciting, interesting thing about the whole piece of work has been uh, about the conversations that sparked between people, um, about an increased willingness for people to share what they're doing in their businesses. It's not seen as much as it may perhaps in the past um, as being a individual company kind of uh, employment practice it is much more about well this is what we're doing and this has worked why don't you try this as well and that's been really heartening um mm. uh, and a really positive outcome one that i don't i don't think we expected at the beginning of this you, you touched on uh, on gender and congratulations uh, so that uh, the share of female leadership has gone up and is i think uh, above your targets a bit early actually earlier than you had anticipated so uh, it could not be better um, you did also touch on ethnicity. So there, I understand it's more complicated. So tell us a little bit more why why it's it's not going as smoothly and, and what are you going to do to kind of rectify that situation? Well, the honest answer is we were starting at a much lower level to start with in, as, as an industry um, uh, in terms of the number of people from diverse ethnic backgrounds working within the industry. So we originally set a target to ensure that 15% um, of people in the workforce would come from um, black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And we set that target because that's um, reflective um, of um, uh, the, uh, the UK average. Um, it's, it, I mean, these targets are always going to be slightly arbitrary. They're, they're not meant to be um, hard and fast. We're not saying that every single company is going to... Um, to employ exactly the same number of people, particularly if you're from a smaller company, clearly um, certain targets are, are going to be much, much harder um, to, to adopt and probably can't in some cases. But we met, we felt, considering we employ around about 30,000 people in the UK, a lot of them based in London, where there's a much higher number of people from, from mixed ethnic backgrounds, that we should be seeking to ensure that we had a greater mix in our in our um, in our workforce, mm. and we have seen some progress. Um, I mean, but but as I say, we we um, we we are starting from a much lower level, which means that um, not only have we got to think long and hard about why we aren't recruiting people initially into um, companies from different backgrounds, but also how we um, help make ensure they stay there. Yeah, uh, and then progress through those businesses to become to, to, to increasingly more senior positions. And those are difficult things to address in two or three years. They take a real long term commitment. Um, and I, again, I think one of the, the I mean, I'm not suggesting we won't um, reach our, our targets, but you've kind of got to set targets and recognize that you may not reach them. Right. These are things to seek to focus attention, try to drive behavior, try to give us something to, to rally around. But um, they shouldn't be seen as sticks to hit people with. If if if, if they're as long as they are trying to and, and ambitious about what they're trying to do, this and is about the right direction. direction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly that. Exactly that. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, as we've just heard from Stephen, so within the UK, there are now I think more than fifty percent of the senior leadership occupied by women. I think great example how we can address the issue of gender diversity in senior levels with publishing. And to continue along this line of thinking, we have Badur al Qasimi, the vice president of the IPA and the next president. Um, and Badur also founded the Publisher Network that is led by publishing leaders to address gender imbalances and to drive the agenda for change. Welcome, Badur. Um, you are the founder of Publisher Network and you're now celebrating the first birthday this year. So a happy birthday to the, to the network. Um, how important is it for you to have, I think, to have women 
in your own network and, and how is it really helping to drive change? Thank you, Mikhail. And before I start, I just want to really take a minute to thank the team behind Publishers Without Borders for bringing us together again uh, to have a, a meaningful discussion. Uh, I also want to thank you personally, Mikhail, for uh, driving the agenda on diversity and inclusion. I know you've championed this uh, personally, and I know you've champion championed it in Elsevier, mm -hmm. and you have also been one of the factors of change in IPA during your presidency. So as the IPA immediate past president, you have brought diversity and inclusion to the table and addressed it, and we talked about it many times. And I really think it's because of your discussions that I am where I am today. A woman of color as VP of IPA has never happened before. And it's only through these discussions that you've opened the possibility. You've, and, and people are you know, accepting it and are, they're okay with it and they're championing it now because the more diverse voices we have around the table, the better our decision-making will be. So this is a shout out to Mikhail. Thank you, Mikhail, for championing this wherever we go and being, you know, the voice of diversity and inclusion. So um, to answer your question, um, I just want to talk a little bit about why I founded Publish Her. And those of you who listened to my talk here at Publishers Without Borders would have heard this before. But I always found myself through my travels and through various meetings and book fairs to be the only woman in the room. And I would, you know, feel very lonely and intimidated at times being in meetings and being the only woman there. And um, as much as I um, looked for female companionship, I thought it was also important to have our voice present at decision-making tables. You know, I think that was something I felt was missing. Uh, and so I decided to found, to found Publish Her, which is a network for female publishers where we could get together and share experiences and stories and really support each other to be in leadership positions. And this is what I found, that even if there are a lot of women in the publishing industry, energizing the publishing industry with their beautiful ideas and thoughts and energy, a few of them managed to make it to the top. Wow. And that's something that worried me and, and puzzled me a lot. And so I decided to, to, to have founded Publish Her, and we'll put the link down for those of you who are interested in, in looking at our website and subscribing to our newsletter. And through Publish Her, we've managed to really bring together a community of female publishers to come together and really discuss pressing issues that we're concerned about in our industry and how we can support each other to get to those leadership positions, whether it's through mentorship, whether it's through training, capacity development, uh, networking, um, you know, addressing uh, the issues with recruitment, for example. So um, we've also conducted a survey where we're trying to really find out what are the roadblocks, what is stopping women from really succeeding in this industry and getting to the top. And we will publish the results of this survey later in the year, and we would love, love, love to have more input on the survey. So we'll also include that link later down below for anybody who has who wants to join and wants to give their voice to, to publish her. Do you, I know the survey is not you know all wrapped up, but you did mention so the roadblocks that, that you kind of experience or that you hear from from other female publishers that they experience. Could you mention a couple of them and any recommendations how to overcome the roadblocks, how to overcome adversity, so to say? Sure. I mean, what we're really looking at, um, Mikhail, is to have an enabling environment for women to thrive. And I think, you know, there were differences in the stories and the narratives that we heard, but what we really felt was missing, and this is, I think, the core of what DNI means and what DNI means to me, is that to have real opportunities for everyone based on merit and not on gender or ethnicity or any other category. And that's something that we felt was still a roadblock for a lot of women. And I believe that now, I mean, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit later about this, but we're looking right now at what's happening globally with, with COVID-19. And it's in times of crisis like this, this is where we can also see the ramifications 
a lot more on those who are more vulnerable in society. Mm -hmm. So for example, what's going to happen to the publishing industry post COVID-19? Yeah. And this is where Publish Her really has to, to take a step forward and say that, you know, diversity and inclusion is not just a great program to have, it's an essential program to have. Uh, it's something that anybody in any uh, business or any industry has to have this as their basic operations principle. Because if you discriminate against those who are more vulnerable, this is where you're going to see the cracks in society later on. And I just want to really give a shout out to uh, Stephen and to the UK publishing industry who have really done an amazing job in terms of bringing uh, bringing that to the forefront and building practices and cultures that create a fair and equal atmosphere for their employees. And I believe that we're going to see some great, great examples coming out of the UK publishing industry post COVID-19 where women in the UK will probably weather the storm a little bit better than other counterparts around the world because this program has been in place. And, you know, I urge uh, everybody to have a look at the um, the study that was conducted by the UKPA and to see how they can benefit from for their own companies or their own publishing industries or national associations so that we can all come out of this in a better shape. Okay. Great. You did take a little bit of a, a step forward into the future. So, uh, and of course, next year you will be the IPA president for two two year term. Um, and so how are you going to put diversity and inclusion um, at, at the heart of the IPA, so to say, uh, in the next two years under your presidency? Well, I think, um, Mikhail, you started the discussion and it's a very important discussion. We need to continue an IPA. I mean, we can't stop. And it's something that I intend to uphold and continue uh, to cherish the values of DNI and those um, in IPA. I also want to work closely with our colleagues from different committees to make sure that we achieve all our DNI goals. And with your support, I hope you're not going to intend to leave us soon. Uh, well, well. Continue the conversation with you uh, as the presidential envoy of diversity and inclusion. But I think that the future belongs to industries and businesses that are really diverse. And it's just a smart policy to have views and decision when views and decisions are made to have as many ideas on the table. And that's the only way we can actually reach a an equilibrium and really have the, the best answers to our questions is when everyone's voices have been heard and when everybody has contributed um, to the discussion. And you know, you mentioned a little bit what DNI means to you personally, Mikhail, and I love that analogy of having everybody in the party and everybody is allowed to join and everybody's welcome to join, not necessarily, um, you know, it doesn't really matter where they're from. The way I see it is a little bit more simple. I would say for me, DNI means equal opportunity for all. So mm -hmm. it might sound a little bit idealistic, but this is what I what I see. So if you imagine having the drive and the passion and the ideals and the courage to persist and the imagination, you should also be allowed to operate in an environment that supports that. Yes. So you should not be discouraged by government policies or investment decisions or working cultures. And there are many ways to create that enabling environment. And the first and the most important is the internal culture. So mm. we need to establish a culture that doesn't discriminate against anyone in the industry, no matter what their background is, what their color or gender is, or, or anything like that. So if we believe it's the right thing to do, then businesses will flourish. And it ties back also to what Stephen mentioned, uh, the unconscious bias trainings, the psychological safety, all those you kind of ways you can address uh, the company culture, so to say. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Boudour. Um, as we discussed actually in the start, a unique part of how publishers can drive diversity and inclusion is, of course, related to what we publish, the type of content that we produce. And now joining our panel is Ed Nawotka. He's a journalist at Publishers Weekly. Welcome, Ed. So a question for you. On a long term, as a long term industry observer, how have you seen diversity and inclusion impact the publishing industry? How has it been changing over time? 
there's been um, let, me, let me start off by saying thank you for the Welcome opportunity. And I understand, um, you know, I'm speaking, I'm trying to speak as a objective uh, journalist, and we always bring our own biases to bear on this question. Um, when I started covering the book business 20 years ago, this was not a topic. The DNI was not on the agenda. It wasn't an issue. It's been in the last decade. It's really come to the forefront, and you're seeing um, you're seeing it put very much at the top of many agendas at many uh, institutions. It's not just the uh, publishing uh, publishing houses uh, or journals like our own. Um, it's really in, at an institutional level, and. Um, Progress is always incremental, uh, but I think it's been gaining momentum as uh, as institutions like the IPA have taken notice and and again high uh, spotlit it. Um, I think if you look, uh, just take like a very facile example. Uh, if you look at the two top fiction books that were given awards in the United States this past year. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction was won by Colson Whitehead for a second time. He's an African-American writer about a novel that fictionalizes a, under um, uh, a, a sort of secret history of Af a part of African-American history. Uh, the National Book Award was won by an author named Susan Choi, uh, who looks at a diverse group of artistic high school students in my hometown of Houston, Texas, in a novel uh, called Trust Exercise. Um, that's a very facile example and certainly doesn't represent the industry as a whole, but again, progress is incremental. Um, addressing it at an institutional level uh, has really become a, almost a grassroots issue because I think a lot of the institutions, uh, the big uh, publishing houses, while they may want to have policies in place to, to foster diversity um, and inclusion, it's it's uh, it takes generational change. Half of the uh, half of the people under the age of fifteen in the United States are not white, uh, and I think what what where that really needs to change is at a level where people see people who look like them in these professions. Uh, mm -hmm. That's both uh, that's both skin color, uh, ethnicity, uh, religious diversity, but that's also I think. Um, uh, about class, you know, people need to be able to see within their own communities that publishing, that writing, that uh, producing and communicating in this way is something that's accessible to them, whether they're rich or poor, black or white, um, where they, whether they're in New York City or not. And again, I, I um, geographic diversity in the United States and as it is in London is a big issue uh, because I, I used to joke that Brooklyn has ruined American literature because everybody's concentrated in one neighborhood and they're writing to impress each other, publishing to impress each other, rather than publishing to to seduce, if you will, into books, the rest of the country, which has another 330 million people in it. So uh, all of those issues need to be addressed. It's good that it's happening, but there's always need for more. And, um, and we can talk in some depth about that. You know, there's right now currently, for example, again, looking specifically at African-American issues, there are, mm -hmm. only, there are only 22 agents, African-American agents serving the industry, uh, which- total and, number of agents? There are thousands. Uh, there, there are hundreds of active agents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, um, but it's a, it's, a real, it's a very, very small number. And, and yeah. really of those, only a certain amount are really active and powerful enough to, to get a book made. Yes. Um, and that's a, you know, for example, you talk about we need diverse books. There's also a movement, we need diverse agents. So yeah. all of those issues come to bear. And I hope that that's um, anything that can contribute to this conversation, I think will ultimately advance this conversation. So you, I want to pick up on, on I would say, the, the regionalism or mm -hmm. why publishing is dominated by, by big cities, so to say. And maybe it's it's not surprising that I'm in Amsterdam and Stephen is in London sure. and, and Ed would like to be in New York, but you're in Houston. Um, so, Stephen, what what did your survey show about that? Yeah, I mean, our, our survey reinforces a lot of people's uh, preconceptions of our, of our industry, which is in, in the UK. We are largely recruiting people who came from the same schools, were educated at the same universities, who came from relatively privileged 
backgrounds and came from a, a relatively concentrated geographic area. Yeah. And um, and that's been the way it's been for a very, for a very long time. Um, that's not to defend it. Um, we are starting to, um, to look at, well, not just starting to look at, publishers are taking concrete action to address that. So a number of publishers are um, opening regional offices mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing the fact that if they want to um, uh, employ people from different parts of the country, they're going to have to actually start basing themselves in different parts of the country. And as Ed has touched on, the um, being based in um, one of the world's largest but also most expensive cities um, has a real impact on the people who can afford to come yeah. and, um, and work in, yeah. in your industry and also the way that you recruit them. So there used to be very much a kind of process of unpaid internships and therefore uh, immediately the kind of people who can usually afford to do that tend to be from certain types of backgrounds. So that's all changing. Um, lots of publishers have removed the requirements to have degrees. They've started changing where they're recruiting from. Um, we've got new apprenticeship programs um, uh, in the UK to try and ensure that people don't have to have degrees, they can come straight in. Um, but that will take time. It will take time particularly to filter up towards the top. But do you have any pers perspective from your side? Because you've been really active, of course, first in the Arab world, but also to put African publishing on the map. Uh, we together were in Lagos, and later you went to, to, to more seminars of the IPA. So, is there a, a I would say African or global th South perspective on the, on DNI? Sure, I, I'd love to answer that, Mikhail. But if you don't mind, um, I just want to quickly answer Simon's question. He uh, he just posted a question here on um, children's literature and diversity and inclusion, which has been like. It sparked my interest, so to speak, as a, as a children's publisher. Uh, it's something that I personally really um, am concerned about. I, I uh, make sure that the kind of books we publish in Kelimat Group, for example, as a children's book publisher, really um, represent that uh, ideal and that thought, which is to have as many diverse um, uh, characters in our book, so to speak. Uh, we do that by uh, obviously working with illustrators and writers who believe that DNI, I mean, that's the first place that we have to start is with children's books and children's minds, because once you dispel any stereotypes and myths at a young age, they become immediately quite open-minded individuals as they grow up and they've seen diverse characters in the books they've read as children and they've been exposed to that from a young age. So for me, it is actually a very important mission that I uh, that I take quite seriously as a children's book publisher. Um, I also make sure that we have representation uh, of children with disabilities in our books, for example, as, as main characters or as, uh, you know, uh, side characters in our, in our books. And, and that's important as well to make sure that we're representing um, all walks of life in our in our uh, books. We do that by publishing our own, but we also buy, uh, you know, foreign rights of books that do that very well. And there are many, many publishers around the world who champion that as well. Great. So well I definitely salute you for that. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to segue to the next question. <laughs> Well, now I was just saying, I just actually published a blog on, on this topic. This is a study that a, a university professor has done here in the Netherlands, uh, looking at textbooks and, and, and how are uh, women and, and minorities uh, uh, depicted. And uh, so even in the Netherlands, which is you know, a liberal uh, society, so to say, um, women were still underrepresented. Um, and also there were lots of stereotypical. So if there was, a, say, uh, a, a person of color, uh, he was often the athlete, <laughs> um, and uh, as an illustration. So, and there were no LGBT characters at all, which is you know quite surprising. Uh, so I think it's very good that you know we have data on that. So that's why I also definitely salute always the UKPA because they, they do a, an excellent job measuring, um, and then you can have a great dialogue with the publishers, uh, what is going well and what can we still improve. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, just to go back to your question again, yeah. Mikhail, I, I don't know, you had you had given me a few questions before Then maybe I can like just quickly mention the importance of, of, of men in championing yeah. publish her because that's something that I had faced in the past where, you know, is this just an all girls club? Are men included? What are, you know, what are, what are you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think 
I just want to clarify that it's very important that both men and women champion uh, publish her and um, and DNI programs on gender and equality. So, uh, for example, both of you, you and uh, Mikhail and Stephen, were set to speak at our Publish Her Summit in London, which didn't no. happen. Fortunately, but we would love to continue that conversation and really have both of you present in our next Publish Her event when things are safe and, and can host an event um, with people involved. Um, but I also, uh, you know, want to say that it's very, very important that we continue engaging with male colleagues because it's that's where I, I believe we'll be able to see the change happen quickly. And men are our biggest champions, so it's very important to have men's voices as well championing. Uh, more inclusion for women in these circles and at the decision-making table, and um, the more we the more we do that, I believe that the more equality we'll have and women's voices will be included. Yeah, I'm fully supportive of the, that that line of thought. I mean, if, if you take another lens of of the ENI, say people with disability, it's not the burden of people with disability to change that world. It's the able-bodied people who really should be more considerate and more empathetic, and really think, you know, what can we do together to you know to 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 kind of improve the world uh, with all lenses of of diversity. So you no, know, uh, and that of course that definitely applies also to gender. Ed, is there anything you would like to jump in on on this discussion? Because uh, I didn't well, really get around to ask you a follow-up question. Well, there are some. I mean, there are just um, two things occurred to me. It's it's a very it's a very prag. There's a lot of very pragmatic issues that can be should should be addressed. And just as an observer of the industry over the years, and having you know grown up, if you will, uh, since my twenties in the business, there's two things that we we could also look at, which may not be as obvious. One is, is I think you have a generational issue. So for example, in the United States, when you, when you do not have a safety net for retirement, when you do not have the assurance that when you move to a new career, you step out of a position of power that you will be um, taken care of, people tend to hold on to their jobs much, much longer. So I think that that has prevented a lot of, if you will say, you know, women or people who are not, say, straight white males into moving into positions of power. And I'm not just talking about corporate publishing, I'm talking about small publishers as well that may have been established a generation or two ago. People tend to hold on to those jobs longer. It prevents people from moving up. This is a complaint, complaint you'll certainly hear from millennials, uh, Gen, Gen Z. I'm Gen X, which is kind of in between the boomers. That's one of the issues. Um, but more to that point as well, this is a little anecdotal, but I think it's been borne out so many times. When you, when I have friends and colleagues who, for example, were living in New York and working in publishing, there's a massive gap, uh, particularly among women in talents between about the ages of 28 and about 40, because people want to start families. They simply mm. don't make enough money to do so. So what happens is people either leave the industry around 28 for a different job, when they begin the urgency to start a family begins perhaps, uh, or they tend to wait, and this is also the men too, until they're right at that cusp of 40, and they tend to go for IVF or, you know, um, or fertilization, because you will look, and I'm not joking, how many people do you know in publishing who have twins or triplets? Because they have held off for so long. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it may sound anecdotal, but it's a, it's a genuine issue because you lose an entire decade of career development around that age, around the period of 30, which can really be a sort of peak period for learning, developing new skills, being innovative, uh, potentially, um, you know, potentially experimenting, if you will, because you tend to be a little bit less conservative uh, in those years as well. Those are very anecdotal observations. But I think that that's generally applicable when I've looked across the world. I mean, this is not entirely isolated to the US and Canada. I've seen this in South America and Asia, uh, even in South Africa, uh, places I've, I've worked. So just something to think about that. How do we address those issues you know, as well? Because that's, um, that's what I think has prevented a lot of very, very talented people from staying in our industry. Re retention, I think, will help us with DNI as well. So I know it's a bit of a different field, but from our studies at Elsevier in the world of research, we 
exactly that pattern. So there, there is this this stage where where female researchers are are not as productive uh, in the number of papers like their male counterparts. Although uh, when they publish, they're usually more cited. And then after that phase, actually, there's a group of female researchers that completely yeah. outperform the men, by the way, which I also find. So if yeah. you know you go through that transition and you make it to the, those difficult periods, uh, which somehow only affects, uh, affects female researchers, yeah. not and, the and, male ones, and, and to, to really well, to, yeah. I mean, to, to Bedour's point, the uh, men benefit from this too. You know, both genders are gonna benefit equally in this regard um, if, uh, women in particular are given this opportunity to 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 find a way as because the they will often have partners I, of either gender that can uh, you know that are also often in the industry that we're in because we do yeah. tend to we do mm -hmm. tend to uh, pair up this way if you yeah. will. <laughs> Very good. Let's I think I mean we do already alluded to it. We are in the midst of a pandemic uh, and hopefully we're slowly getting out of it. Uh, and this, of course, has an impact on on DNI. So um, I would like to ask the panel, and, and anybody can take these questions, or you can all chip in. So how do you feel that the the, the pandemic has kind of impacted DNI? We heard some stories of uh, that it has impacted the underprivileged much more. That has impacted women in a an adverse way more. Um, others also feel it's like an opportunity. Uh, so there's a silver lining. Uh, so how do you guys see it? I, maybe Stephen, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, well, look, look, I mean, a starting point, I think um, uh, I've had more discussions with um, other men about childcare and responsibilities during the lockdown than I ever have had before. And I think mm -hmm. that is a really productive and positive step forward that actually it's not, um, you're, seeing, you're seeing shifts generally in society, but particularly in moments when um, there, there, are, there are forcible changes in how we're operating, people start to think a lot more about what it means to have to both work and look after children at the same time. And yes. coming back to points that both Ed and um, Badur touched on about um, men's responsibility in this, Men's, men obviously have responsibility in relation to advocacy, but there is also um, around, there are really big issues like um, uh, paternity leave and care and how we create really flexible working, which have an impact on both um, sexes and and their capacity to be able to change the nature of how work operates. My big fear in relation to coronavirus, of course, is particularly women who tend to be um, in more part-time jobs um, uh, and, um, on, um, um, and on lower paid jobs in the UK anyway, that's just um, statistically the way it is. Yeah. But often those are the jobs who are most disproportionately affected during mm. any, any recession. So I would, I would of course be concerned that the, the coronavirus is going to have, a, uh, or the response, the impact of it is going to have a big impact on, on um, diversity. That all said, I do think there are huge opportunities for us as employers to think about how we change the way we work going forward. This has forced us to really kind of put into place different practices, and though there are really important lessons that we can learn from that. A final thing I'd say is um, a number of the uh, comments in the um, in uh, on the live commentary uh, around the content within books, and yeah. yeah, again, I am I am concerned that um, there have been some really great small publishers springing up in the UK who were specifically um, focused on increasingly diverse um, books, and 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 but the fact that they are often um, very small publishers who have only recently started, they again are very exposed, and we're obviously doing everything we can to support them. Um, but there are there that you have to worry that there's going to be a, a noticeable impact on diversity and inclusion if we don't um, really focus on making sure it doesn't. Badur, anything from your side? Yeah, I touched a little upon it a little bit earlier, but I just want to say that um, I believe that during a crisis like like this one. This is where we see the cracks in any industry and they get amplified uh, and magnified, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And unfortunately, the ramifications could be more damaging. Uh, the United Nations warned that the worst off in a society we are, the worst off we're going to be during a pandemic. And unfortunately, this inequality will be amplified, especially for women in general. And so how important is it for us to have this discussion right now and really bring it to the 
forefront and really talk about the importance of DNI in our publishing industry. So women and other vulnerable categories in our society, unfortunately, receive the bad end of the stick. Uh, and in any economic crisis. So uh, when there's gonna be any layoffs and, or pay cuts, uh, we immediately see that those who are uh, most vulnerable will be the ones who are going to be pushed out uh, first. So it's very important for us to highlight this right now, to bring it to the discussion, to bring it to the table. And um, so in my opinion, will COVID-19 be a setback for female publishers or a leap forward? My answer is both yes and no. So female, pu female publishers who are operating in environments that have strong DNI cultures and practices, I believe they're going to do well. And I believe the opposite is true. Having said that, I hope that this is an opportunity and a turning point for our industry's history and that more women are going to be given the opportunity to lead and that we could actually set a good example for other industries to follow. I read somewhere a report that uh, stated that there were um, uh, female leaders in countries uh, with, uh, or, or so, so to speak, the countries with yeah. the that handled the COVID nineteen pandemic a little bit better than others. Taiwan, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Taiwan and yeah. New Zealand and Germany and others, for example. Yeah. I'm not surprised actually because female leadership style brings to the table a lot of additional elements that have been traditionally absent. I would say from the standard decision-making tools of male leaders. And I believe that it's true to our industry. So I just want to say that the more diverse, the better we are in the long term. Ed, any views post-pandemic from, from your side? Well, there's there's gonna be um there's going to be a couple of, a couple of issues that really need to be addressed. One of one of them is people advance, uh, tend to advance through networking and through mentorship. And this is going to be a real challenge as everybody has much, much, is going to potentially have much more limited access to new people. I mean, for example, this network here, this is an existing uh, published uh, borders is a network of people who largely knew each other in a different context prior to this. So how do we create new networks and support uh, systems for people who uh, may or may not have access to each other in person? Um, you know, the, one of the jokes about the uh, in New York is that this is the pandemic is spelling the death of the publisher's lunch, which is so important to getting business done. Uh, yeah. At the same time, it is going to create new opportunities. Uh, we saw this in 2008 when the 2009 uh, in the last serious economic recession. Uh, when New York shed about 10 to 15 percent of its publishing jobs um, in a very, very short period of time. Unfortunately, a lot of people had to move back home, uh, but those people also opened new publishing houses across, I'm speaking of North America. Uh, mm. So you did see a sort of proliferation of some new voices. Now, sustaining those is always a challenge. So there's, there's both a silver lining, but mentorship is the big issue, I always think, in networking. Uh -huh. to, to that point, I'll say briefly, Publishers Weekly, which I'll, I'll throw in here, is free through this period for people. And I really encourage people to take a look at it. Put Type the word diversity, type the word inclusion into our search box, and you'll be surprised at how much attention this has been given over the last decade. Um, we're gonna, we have an article, uh, I believe it's running this week, which is about individuals who've, who and organizations who've started their own support systems. They've started uh, they're giving money for internships to pay internships to work in publishing. Uh, may they be from a specific group of people who are underrepresented in the industry. Uh, so you're seeing real grassroots efforts and supporting those. I think will they may pay b bigger dividends than than campaigning at a big corporate publisher. You know, to to have them hire more interns who are who are diverse or inclusive. I really think ground up entrepreneurial thinking is what will will advance this and mm. expedite this in the industry. And that's not just North America, that's really around the world. So we talked a lot about DNI with the gender lens um, and ethnicity came up a bit. Are there other lenses that you know we should also really cover in this discussion? Do you want me to have a, a yes. quick one? Yeah, I mean, yes, of course there are. I mean, um, the uh, survey that we do tries to cover a huge range of, of areas. Um, and we keep adding to it. So um, some of the areas that we've, we've been looking at are disability, mm -hmm. uh, 
looking at, um, and that in its kind of in its broadest sense, obviously there are physical disabilities, but there are also mental health um, concerns that people have as well. We are asking people questions not only about whether or not they they suffer from whether it's represented in the industry, but how comfortable they are talking to their employers about it, um, and what support is offered within the, their businesses. Um, again, I mean, this is an issue which faces the whole of society um, in the UK and globally. Um, actually, publishing does pretty well on disability relative to the wider economy, but it's still a long, long way off um, uh, fully representing the number of people who have disabilities in our society being able to get access to, to working with us. And then, and of course, there is disability for our staff, or people with disability for our staff. But it's also accessibility of our content, of course, right? So, yeah, Absolutely. another interesting dimension there as well. Yeah, and look, there's been there's been real um, progress um, on particularly on some of the accessibility issues and and the Marrakesh Treaty. But there is a huge amount um, more that needs to be done. Um, right. uh, and we we work with various accessibility groups to try and um, to try and push that forward. But that, that that there's still a lot more that, that needs to be done, and and I think as other people have mentioned in the in the comments as well, um, it's also about representation within our with our with our books as well that we publish. Um, there's a very low number of um, characters, but also lead characters, um, protagonist, protagonists in um, in books who often have disabilities. I mean, the way we looked at it was um, we would start with our workforce. Um, we kind of looked at it as a bit of a kind of a circular firing shot uh, squad where everybody was trying to blame each other why were we why was there not more diverse people working in the industry why was our books not diverse enough why were there not enough diverse authors why are there not diverse enough agents well we started with the one thing that we could control but we hope that that will have a, a kind of have a virtuous circle and impact every part of the chain beyond that thank you thank you i see a question flash up and i think ed already alluded to it so maybe you want to to take this question as well and then we go sure. for a, a round of uh, final contributions from all the panelists. I, I do, I do. I mean, in answer to that question, I very much do think that that's the case. And I think it's very important, um, much in the way that we lament uh, underrepresentation from certain parts of the world. I mean, I, I know Badur, myself, are both in, um, you know, we've done quite a bit of work in Africa. Um, I'm less familiar with with your both of your, your roles, but um, and we would like to see more of that. In the same way, any kind of geographic diversity uh, will will make things more inclusive. Uh, I think that we see that. And borders are, are sort of irrelevant. If you look at um, indigenous publishing in North America, that does not acknowledge a border between Canada and the United States. That is a, but it's a very underrepresented, but very important part of our, our shared cultural history. That's just to take one example. Um, so I think you're. I think it will really foster that people. When you don't have to live in a big urban center like London, um, Amsterdam, uh, even Dubai or uh, Sharjah, which it can be quite expensive places, uh, yeah. New York City, um, it gives you opportunities. You can take risks with publishing that you wouldn't otherwise take, uh, which I think is also very important. One uh, one publisher I know likes to joke that. DNI should also include uh, literary publishing like poetry because it's often seen as a second class citizen. So uh, uh, that's, yes. Yes. there we go. Good. Thank you. Um, for some closing remarks, maybe I'll go first to Badur. Thank you, ladies first in this case, I guess. Um, thank you, Mikhail. I just want to uh, end by expressing my gratitude really to have this discussion today because I feel like this is a very important time and place to discuss this. I mean, as I mentioned at the introduction, I wouldn't be where I am today if Mikhail hadn't opened the door about to talk about diversity and inclusion. I really believe that. I believe that you brought it to the table. You made it a, a very important issue for people to consider. A woman of color now in the helm of uh, IPA leadership is something that would have been unheard of five years ago, which is not that long ago. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity because you don't know what door we're going to open just by having this discussion. The people listening here today might go back to their publishing houses and really think about what has been talked about today. So it's very important for us to really champion this, to talk about it, and to give other people opportunities 
to express that. Uh, I also just want to touch upon uh, the importance of emerging markets. This is a question you asked me a little bit earlier, but I didn't really get a chance to to mention. So uh, as a way of really um, giving back to the communities uh, in IPA that have been perhaps underrepresented, my role as VP has been really to focus on emerging markets like Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And that's something that I was very passionate about and bringing them to the forefront, to the decision-making tables by having them as uh, members of our EC, members in our committee, and visiting them in their hometowns to really get to know them and show them that we value their publishing industries. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Add some final remarks from your side. I do. Um, I'd just like to say that one of, I, again, I very much appreciate being asked to be a part of this conversation because I think um, anything that we can do, again, is going to advance, advance publishing, with, which ultimately, in my uh, estimation, should advance our cultures. Um, I was going to take a slightly different take on it and say that when we talk about DNI, I think the industry is going to need to consider looking at itself as something more than a producer of books or printed material. Uh, because audio has become such an important part of our industry, uh, video content uh, particularly, and especially with uh, the access and the, the ease of access that younger creators, the new generation of creators, um, is finding by producing video, by producing audio, uh, I think it's going to behoove us to embrace that as part of our definition of publishing. YouTube creators, podcast creators, uh, because it's much more accessible to, to people uh, who, who may not have a year to write a book, may not have uh, an entire academic career to research a book. Um, I think that publishing needs to look at that as an inclusive, as part of its inclusivity. Um, and, and naturally, I think that's going to embrace the younger generation of creators. And I think that there's also financial opportunities there that we are missing out as a, as a global industry by not looking at ourselves as, um, as part of, as embracing and including those industries as well. It's, uh, it's real, so in a way it's embracing youth, but it's expanding our own professional mandate that I think will help us sustain and keep us relevant to an audience that may dismiss us unless we can address them more directly and include them. So. Great. No, I really like it. I see that uh, uh, that there is support coming in from all over the world. They like oh, it. Oh, cool. The medium, <laughs> beyond the medium, I would say, right? So beyond the print medium. Great. Happy uh, to see it. Yeah, I really, I really, and I'm sincere in that in that desire. Yeah. Stephen, some final words from Europe. Yeah, I'll keep my my brief and um, thank you again to Publishers Without Borders for hosting this. It genuinely is wonderful to discuss this. So many people do. So many different people across different parts of the world. I mean, I think to pick up where Ed let off, um, there's so much. Of this is about us remaining relevant in a, in, a, in a ever changing society, right? I mean, we, we tend to focus on the, the the specifics of the, the policies we're putting in place and the, and whether or not targets are right or what specific practices are needed or what diversity means, and all of that's really really important. But it's it is about can we continue to find a place in the future world? And part of that's going to be making sure that we are producing content which is relevant and the easiest way to produce content that's relevant is making sure that we have people working for us writing for us involved in us uh, who, who are from a diverse different backgrounds so i mean it's it's a it's a that seems to be like a very good point to end on and um thank you again for having me great well i would like to thank uh, the excellent panel so thank you so much it was a like, wonderful i think hour together um i personally learned a lot and i see also that the feedback is very positive already so big thank you for, for to all of you thank you for prashant and publishers without borders for hosting us here and as a final word um i cannot emphasize enough that publishers around the world they have really shown that we can be agents of change we can and be agents of societal change. We can address together gender inequality, for instance. Um, and the power of publishing in shaping our future societies should not be underestimated. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you again soon.